Welcome to KubeCon 2021 North America SIG Auto Scaling um, presentation. Uh, my name is Joseph Burnett. I'm a contributor working on horizontal pod auto scaling. Um, and I'm going to walk you through a few basics of Kubernetes auto scaling today. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the SIG as well, um, give you an example of what uh, Kubernetes auto scaling does so you can understand some of the terminology and how to use it. Uh, and I'm going to talk a few minutes about some upcoming features. And I'll save some time at the end for questions. So who are we? SIG auto scaling um, has the scope of horizontal and vertical pod auto scaling. Um, this is changing the size of pods vertically or making more or fewer of them horizontally. Cluster proportional system component auto scaling is just a very simple auto scaler that uh, adjusts the number of pods in a deployment based on uh, the size of the cluster. So for example, kubedns uses this. Um, also, uh, SIG auto scaling is responsible for cluster auto scaler, which actually uh, sizes up and down the cluster itself. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how those interact with each other in a few minutes. Uh, the chairs of SIG auto scaling are Guy Templeton, who works at Skyscanner, and Marcin Viglis, who works at Google. And here's a link here to the community page, which should be linkable from the PDF uploaded with this presentation. This will tell you all about the SIG meetings and all the information about the uh, this special interest group. OK, so let me start with a quick overview of the auto scaling space in Kubernetes. Um, there is two dimensions here to consider, um, horizontal and vertical. And they're separated by two layers, pods and nodes, or workload and cluster auto scaling. So HPA scales in and out. I mentioned already it makes more or fewer pods based on metrics that you predefine. You can scale on more than one metric if you want. For example, CPU utilization, maybe some uh, pub sub uh, queue length or something. Uh, vertical pod auto scaling um, is for those workloads which don't necessarily scale horizontally as well, or maybe you would prefer to give more or fewer resources to a pod to adjust for usage. Or maybe you just don't know what to request. Um, VPA can actually give you um, uh, recommendations in a read-only mode, um, or you can tell it to just go full automatic and resize your pods for you. Uh, cluster auto scaler has the same kinds of auto scaling in and out, making more or fewer nodes in any um, of the node pools that are configured. Uh, vertical auto scaling in cluster auto scaler is more about selecting the right node pool. So it sees you have a pod, where do I want to put that? It knows not to scale out a small uh, VM size. It needs to scale out one that's big enough for the pod. So um, there's an aspect of vertical auto scaling in uh, cluster auto scaler. So I'm going to walk you through kind of a quick example cluster and what it might look like when you have these auto scaling systems engaged. So there's two workloads here. Um, one of them is a uh, blue workload, uh, which is configured to scale um, horizontally. And there is a purple workload, which is also configured to scale horizontally and vertically, maybe vertically on memory, horizontally on CPU, or something like that. Um, side note, it's not a good idea to scale horizontally and vertically on the same metric, because you'll have two systems trying to optimize the same, uh, the same value, and it just uh, they can have undefined behavior. Uh, I'm also going to show you how cluster autoscaler sort of adds capacity and brings it back in, which is actually a really important part. So let's suppose that uh, you get some extra traffic for this blue service. So the HPA sees that you are consuming slightly above the target average. Maybe like you know you're shooting for 60% and you're up at 75, 80% CPU. So it figures out how many more pods you would need it in order to bring that back down to your target, assuming that all the pods pretty much do the same thing. And so it's, it turns around and increases the desired replicas. The way that it actuates this is by updating the scale subresource of the target. 
So you can point HPA actually to anything that implements the scale subresource, which includes, of course, deployments and replica sets. But you can even um, point it at uh, custom resource definitions, CRDs. As long as you implement the scale subresource, HPA can scale it. There are some conventions you should uh, follow, like give the correct label selector to the pods that you create. Um, but it's pretty flexible in that respect. Um, so anyway, um, HPA doesn't create the pods itself, but it does tell the, uh, the underlying system to create more. So the blue service scales out. Deployment scales up, replica scales up, pods are created. They get scheduled onto those nodes that has capacity. Right? Pretty, pretty normal. So suppose that, that the purple service also gets some traffic. And it scales up too. As you can see, there's not enough room for that purple pod on that third node there. So it actually gets created unschedulable. And this is this first signal that cluster autoscaler responds to. Uh, cluster autoscaler is going to see this unschedulable pod, and it's actually going to create a new node to put it there. So you can see it's just got this flat node pool here. It just made another node like the others just by scaling up the underlying resource. Um, the the VM management system. And this pod immediately gets scheduled. That's great. Everything's happy. Um, now, let's say that VPA kicks in. Now, VPA is a little bit slower running than, than HPA. It spends its time looking at the usage over time and building a histogram, histogram and, it, and it picks a conservative place of what it thinks you probably need based on, like, uh, historical usage. And it you know, VPA has decided that, that the purple server is way over provisioned on memory. So it is recommending a much smaller size. So the VPA is actually kind of divided into three different uh, systems. One is the recommender, which is just responsible for this observation and recording its recommendation. Then there's an updater system. And the updater is actually an active process that just looks for pods that are not matching their recommended resource consumption. And the updater is responsible for going through and deleting those pods. So the most, one of the most important aspects of the VPA updater is it doesn't delete them all at once. It's very careful to delete them and try to respect some reasonable limits. Uh, so it deletes a pod, not all of them, just one of them, uh, with the expectation that it will get recreated, which is how Kubernetes works. And when it gets recreated, there's another system. The third system is an admission controller that actually rewrites the pod re uh, resource requests for that purple pod to make it smaller. And so it gets scheduled at the correct size. Um, and that is basically how VPA actuation works. So the same thing's gonna happen to the other one. The updater is just gonna kind of keep moving along. It gets deleted, boom, rescheduled. It actually fits really nicely inside this second node here. So you notice we ended up with the uh, unused node, which is, um, which is great actually because uh, the cluster autoscaler will then per it periodically scans the cluster. It'll see that this node is empty, and it'll be like, delete it. And then our cluster scales in. All right, suppose that um, now the day is over, traffic is starting to go down, blue service gets less traffic, uh, HPA notices that this target utilization is lower than the target. Uh, so we're not using as much CPU as we would like to on average. So it will again figure out how many pods it's gonna to need to hit the target and adjust accordingly. It, it scales down by three pods, and then the underlying deployment or replica set deletes three pods. So there they go, and you're back on target. Um, yeah, so that leaves that actually leaves um, uh, one pod on this node, and you can see, it's pretty obvious to you that as a human that you can see there's room on that third node there. So cluster autoscaler is actually going to kick in after a while and do um, some consolidation, defragging. And it's going to delete the pod. That's its first thing it does is it actually taints this node that it wants to get rid of to make sure nothing shows up, nothing new shows up there. And then it, it evicts the pod. It, it deletes the pod. Pod gets goes away and comes back as usual. It gets rescheduled where it can, which is on that third node. So now, again, we have this node that is um, empty, and cluster autoscaler can delete it. And then we get this final state. So you can kind of see how both of these systems scale in and out 
Um, I didn't show you multiple node pools, but Cluster Autoscaler is capable of selecting from different sizes of nodes. Um, and you can kind of see how, um, how uh, they interact with each other. Cluster Autoscaler only responds to unscheduled pots. It's not concerning itself with the utilization, all the metrics, all the custom things you could do for HPA or the histogram of usage like VPA. It's just thinking about putting, giving every pod a home and defragging and removing unused nodes. Um, so that's essentially Kubernetes autoscaling in a nutshell. Now, if there was a cluster proportional autoscaler here, um, it would be creating more pods when there are more nodes and fewer pods when there are fewer nodes. Just very, very, very simple algorithm. It's used for system components because it is so simple. It's, it's you know, sort of a baseline. OK, so let me take a few minutes and talk a little bit about some um, upcoming features. So uh, HPA has actually been around for a long time. It's uh, the first version of HPA, HPA v1, auto-scaled only on uh, CPU utilization, which is what most people use. It's the easiest thing to use. It, it changes quickly. It's compressible. Um, you know already what the what your um, how much you have, so it's easy to configure, right? You could just give it a percentage or a utilization target, um, and you already know what the capacity is because you know what your resource request is. Um, so it's it's a really great choice, but it's not sufficient to cover every use case. So HPA v2 started with v2 beta 1, and there is a v2 beta 2 with slightly different structure. Both of them are roughly equivalent. Um, that was created in order to provide multiple metrics and custom metrics. So the structure of the HPA changed a little bit inside spec. In the HPA object, there's a metrics um, a field. And the metrics is a list. And it's a list of all the metrics you want to auto scale on. And the algorithm uh, will actually, the HPA algorithm will compute a recommendation for each one of those metrics completely independently. OK, say, OK, so CPU says probably we need seven. Your custom metric says we need three. And your other custom metric or memory or whatever says you probably need you know, 10. And then it will select the maximum from those. It's sort of um, uh, optimized for safety you know, to give you enough capacity. And it selects the maximum, which would be that, that 10 uh, recommendation. And then it goes into a phase where it actually applies some uh, limitations. So it limits you to a min and a max, right? You can configure min and max in the HPA. Um, and you can also configure now um, how long you want to wait to scale up or scale down, and also what rate limit you want to apply. So let me give you an example. Uh, HPA v1 has um, an algorithm called scale down stabilization. And um, you want HPA to be responsive, right? Traffic comes in, CPU goes up. You really want to give it capacity as quickly as possible. It's sort of optimized for services, uh, not necessarily for batch. Um, and I'll get to that in just a minute. So you want to be able to scale up right away. So you want to react quickly. So you see the, you see the, the recommendation go up, you go up immediately. But you also don't want to flat, because the metrics, they kind of they go up and down. Right? You don't want to keep creating and deleting pods, because it creates a lot of churn. So um, in order to prevent that churn, there's a stabilization period during which um, the maximum recommendation for a period is selected. Um, so you have to wait you know, and, and, and be sure that you want to scale down. The default is five minutes. So if, for example, if I sort of go up and I kind of wiggle around and then come back down again, I'm not going to, the, the, the HP is not going to scale down until five minutes afterwards. It'll just sort of sit, look, look over the last five minutes and select the maximum recommendation for that period of time. So this is really actually a really great algorithm for most use cases. But again, it's not sufficient for all. So in HPA v2, there's a new feature added called behavior. So also in spec, 
there's a behavior field. And in behavior, you can configure symmetrically uh, scale up and scale down uh, configurations. That includes the stabilization period. The default, of course, is scale down five minutes. The default limits for scaling up is actually a rate, which is um, the maximum of either four pods or two times. So if there's a real quick spike in the metrics, it, it wants to be sure not to overreact. So it has some defaults that were previously hard coded in the HPA. Well, you can configure those now. Um, likewise, you can actually configure a scale up delay if you want. An example use case might be if you're processing batch work off of a, of a pub sub queue, and maybe you have like two or three pods, and you get a whole bunch of messages all at once. Um, you might want to actually, just in order to make sure you make good use of your resources, you might actually want to wait and see how many of those the pods that you have can get through before you scale up. Um, this was sort of the canonical use case used uh, for that cap. And so maybe your pod, two pods can handle all 100 of those messages, even though you like are, are wanting. If you're sort of at a, at a higher rate, maybe you, you know that um, they need to be having fewer per pod. So scale up stabilization is, is a, a good thing to be able to configure. And scale down rate also. I mean, scale up rate is kind of obvious because you don't want to like overreact. Um, but also scale down rate limits are really useful um, just to make sure that uh, you come down off of your uh, scaled down, or the, if the traffic drops, you want to come down off of that sort of gradually. Maybe you um, want to try to smooth out the, the spikes, or maybe you want to make sure your capacity is not going to be needed again, or maybe you just simply have limitations on how fast you can get rid of pods. Maybe you have a database connection. You don't want to like overwhelm it with something. I don't know, whatever. So. Anyway, HPA v2, um, it's been around for a long time in beta, and we need to graduate it to stable. Um, so we've been working on this for a little while, mostly just through just community contributions. A bunch of people have chipped in uh, to create the cap, to create end-to-end um, -end tests for the new features, to fix a few bugs, and um, to create the new API, which is really exciting. Um, it's all it's it's getting along there and I think it's like almost ready to commit There's just a few more comments left on it um, And I think that'll be the first v2 API for kubernetes, which is cool if, as far as I know correct me if I'm wrong um, Yeah, so HPA v2 uh, v1 will stick around for a while. I mean like it's it's GA v2 is gonna be there um, with the next release of kubernetes um, and then we're going to start deprecating the V2 beta versions. Um, the structure is pretty much the same. There's only there was only a few small tweaks uh, that were really necessary. Um, for example, you have you can configure multiple policies for scale limits. Um, and in order to like, for example, an absolute number of pods or a relative number of pods, like a percent or a you know count, and in order to choose which one should be controlling, there's a, a, a select policy enumerator. And, in, and the values are min or max. So if you're scaling up, um, it's going to select the max of four or two times. But if you're scaling down, um, it's actually going to choose, um, max would choose the smallest number because it's actually the max change or the min change. So we've changed the value of the enumeration because uh, early users of this feature were confused by it. But that, I think, is the most significant change. So it's mostly the same as the, as the beta API. And that should be coming soon. There's another feature coming up, um, which, was, uh, which is in the VPA space, support for multiple recommenders. So just in the same way that um, you know HPA needed to be made more flexible to support multiple use cases, this was HPA was mostly extended through metrics. Uh, VPA is actually going to be extended largely through the actual recommender engine, and um, because you know I, I mentioned already, VPA creates the histogram and chooses a conservative place, but a lot of those a lot of those depend on the workload. There's a lot. 
um, of edge cases there that, that might be um, want different defaults. And so um, VPA is just going to have uh, a discriminator, a new field which is actually a struct where you provide the name of the recommender that you want to handle this. This is a common pattern for when you have multiple controllers for a single object. You pick a field with some discriminator, and then there'll be the, the, the default implementation will handle um, empty values or zero values. Um, same thing, VPA, the VPA recommender will handle um, when this field is not present. Um, but if you want to add a custom VPA recommender, you create a controller that handles those. It just ignores anything that doesn't have its name on it. And then you can create a VPA object with that discriminator and target that recommender. And then the rest of the pipeline will be the same. The, um, the updater will see that the pod doesn't match the recommendation. API is the same, so it doesn't matter what recommender produced it. And then um, the admission controller will actually apply those updates when the pod is recreated. So it's a really nice extension. Um, I have a link here to the cap and to a couple of pull requests uh, that are implementing it. Um, and that is also nearing um, completion, so it should be committed soon and available in the next uh, next release of Kubernetes. Uh, so those are two interesting upcoming features that you can um, plan to take a look at. And uh, that concludes most of my content. I wanted to give you a few pointers to like how to get involved in the auto scaling community. We have a Slack channel, SIG Auto Scaling, where you could just drop in, ask general questions. How do I use this? Uh, why is this thing doing that? Um, I have an idea. Uh, what do you think? We're really quite friendly. Um, people are asking questions all the time on there, and there's always somebody that jumps in and answers questions. So um, it's a great place to come and uh, just get plugged in. Um, there's an, another Slack channel, SIG Auto Scaling API. It was created partly to coordinate the HPA v2 um, changes because there's just a lot of different contributors, and I wanted to have kind of a long running thread for it. So, API related um, um, auto scaling stuff. The topic is currently v2 um, GA or stable uh, HPA. Um, so, come check that out too. And of course, um, it's always nice to just talk face-to-face -face or virtually um, and just kind of bounce ideas, see people. Um, so there's a uh, regular weekly meeting. It's at 4 o'clock, 1600 uh, CET time zone. Um, and uh, there's a link there to the Zoom meeting and to the agenda. So if you if you want to talk about something at the, the meeting, just uh, go to the Google Doc there linked under the agenda and just Put your name there and say, "Hey, here, here's something I want to talk to," and then usually in the in the, the SIG meeting we just go in order from top to bottom. And there's usually plenty of time to ask additional questions too. So um, come see us. We're friendly. Um, we're interested in, in new ideas, and uh, we're interested to see how you're using these new features. And um, yeah, it's a it's a good community. So. That is it for my presentation. I hope you enjoyed a quick overview of auto scaling and some upcoming features. And I hope to see you online.